How big and influential is China as a multilateral actor? How is China working within and beyond the United Nations? That is the topic of today's episode of the World Stage, a podcast from the Norwegian Institute of International Affairs, NUPI. I'm Hans Jürgen Gosemir, a senior researcher here at NUPI, specializing in Chinese uh, politics. And with me today is Courtney Fung, associate professor at Macquarie University in Australia. And she's also pretty specialized in China-related matters, not least Chinese approaches to the UN and global security governance. Uh, but before, before starting digging into the more specific issues, uh, Courtney, I wanted to kind of set the table as asking if and how the UN and multilateral organizations actually matter today. We're in a situation where many countries struggle to cooperate in kind of even the simplest terms. So what's the point of spending lots of resources and lots of uh, lots of resources on lots of multilateral institutions with bickering state members? Thank you so much, Hans, um, for having me join you um, on the world stage. You're so welcome. Uh, thank you. And um, for a great opening question. So I think it's better to acknowledge that we certainly are in a period of fragmented international politics. There's a whole variety of new institutions that didn't exist or institutions that are now taking on new members. So we can think about um, in 2022, um, China advanced the World Internet Conference into an international organization. So if we think back to 2021, there was no such player like this on matters of sort of digital governance. We also have a variety of new players joining existing bodies. So the expansion of the BRICS Plus format now, right? Um, we also have to acknowledge, I think, too, that globalization hasn't come out with all the great successes that one would have thought. There still is inequality, inequity, um, various types of environmental externalities. We have a new series of global governance problems, global security problems, where people turn and look to the UN and ask, well, what is the United Nations doing about wars in Ukraine, Gaza, um, ongoing violent conflict in Myanmar? Where are you? And of course, I think, again, there is a much larger question of, I think, for people who have been marginalized in all of these global governance decision-making spaces. So for youth, um, for those of non-male genders, et cetera, where is my space to sort of have a voice on issues that directly affect my life too? So I don't want to ignore that there are these pressures, as you acknowledge in the opening of the question. But I think it is important to remember that a system offered by the United Nations is the only truly global institution system that we have. Um, and many, many issues now are literally global issues and cross-cutting and affecting each other. So, you know, questions of the role of AI in society is not just something now that's a military issue, a defense issue. It's affecting the way that we understand education, medical services, and the ability to try and get surveillance and prevention on future global pandemics that might be coming, et cetera. Um, I also think, again, as much as bickering is part of international diplomacy these days, the opportunity to bicker in an environment where you're meeting 192 other states bickering with you, a whole host of other international um, civil society members, academics, businesses, etc. There's something very important about the ability to clarify and understand and hopefully find solutions that prevent us from choosing the worst outcomes. And I think really this notion of saving us from hell more than actually advancing us towards heaven is sort of the, the real baseline we should measure the relevance of why big international institutions like the United Nations family of IOs matter. All right. So we start from this kind of starting point that although state members bicker and quarrel, um, uh, the multilateral system and international organizations uh, still uh, matter. Um, now let's turn a bit uh, uh, more specifically to uh, what China is doing in the UN and how the kind of overall multilateral system is uh, functioning. So starting off, how big and influential is China, would you say, as a multilateral actor? And um, what should we look for when starting to answer that relatively simple but still quite complex question? No, it's a great question, too. So I think, um, I think we can look at, you know, the words used by Chinese officials themselves. They are very clear that the United Nations is an important component for China's foreign policy. Um, the way that China wants to engage with the world and the way that it wants the world to understand it is to see China as this real 
um, committed player, um, contributing and shaping and actively leading the reform of the global governance system that we have today. Um, in a practical sense, we can see that China is contributing um, a huge amount of funding, so they, are, they will be going up to 20% of the assessed budget contributions next year. They, of course, carry a permanent seat in the UN Security Council, the apex body for handling international peace and security issues, and with that permanent seat comes a veto. So the ability to say, no, we will not proceed down this certain pathway, um, and that actually is very, very important. And certainly, um, China also has a very interesting role. Um, it's different from other great states, so like the United States, the United Kingdom, France, Russia, um, also who are all permanent members in the UN Security Council, in the sense that China is committed to that big power club, but it also is very interested in maintaining its developing world global south status. It fights very hard to make sure that the term is G77 plus China as the representative group that sort of is the moving mass of states that feel that they fall into this particular um, status group. Um, so I think there's a real sort of benefit from sort of these practical things that we can look at, the funding, the veto, the language that's being advanced or propagated by Chinese actors. Sometimes it's really obvious. It'll be, you know, language advanced by the Chinese state when they talk about a community of a common destiny for humankind, which is really Xi Jinping's global governance vision for the way that he thinks international politics should work. Um, and then I think it can be harder to try and understand what the influence is, because certainly when China is absent, um, there's many players still waiting for China to re-engage. So even though they may not be dominant in all multilateral issues across all time, there is this sort of feeling of waiting for that Chinese shoe to drop. Um, and I think it's important to note that while I do see China as being very influential, um, it's certainly there's appetite, I think, from Chinese officials to have even more influence in the UN system, because the UN system doesn't just implement global governance solutions, it designs them too. So the ability to import these ideas, um, to have Chinese ideas and Chinese solutions for global governance problems is really important too. All right. So we see uh, China providing money, uh, people, ideas, uh, initiative. And you've already, uh, I think, spoke a little, uh, spoken a little bit about it. Countries have different kind of diplomatic traditions. Uh, uh, some of them are more distinct than others. Um, are there ways that China is conducting its kind of diplomacy within uh, the multilateral settings that uh, stand out from other countries and other great powers in partic particular? Sure. So I think if we take the great power benchmark, um, I think China is as engaged and well-resourced um, and motivated to push its interests through the international system, um, through this United Nations multilateral system. And I think one thing that sets them apart is their consistent commitment now over the last couple of decades, really to see that the United Nations is an important space for China's own foreign policy goals. Sometimes these goals are very parochial, managing the way that there's criticism of China's human rights record in Xinjiang, um, Hong Kong, also, it's you know managing Taiwan's international space. Um, sometimes these um, activities that China pursues, like any other great power, are much more lofty and ambitious in terms of trying to shape um, future agendas. So what the UN wants to talk about when it thinks it wants to discuss AI. Um, it's unclear. The mechanisms to discuss and manage AI questions are new. And China is trying to have a big say, like any great power would, in terms of deciding the processes and the shape of which discussions will occur. And I think, again, it is interesting that China is moving in a direction like other great powers do. So, for example, to say that China gives, you know, next year 20% of the regular budget is a serious um, contribution, a very significant one. And I think we can track language now where China is making the case because we play a big role financing, we therefore um, should have a greater say in solving these problems A, B, and C. And sometimes solving these problems A, B, and C might be helping to rewrite what the budget is about and how the budget items are spent. Um, sometimes this might also mean that China wants a greater say in terms of drafting language. So I think linking that sort of presence in one funding space to others is something that great powers do. But I think this is also an interesting question because China operates in ways that are also different from the other great powers. Um, if we think about the sort of P5 group, um, in a sense that, for example, China's been relatively reticent to hold the pen 
and really own a particular issue as it moves through the UN Security Council. So China's not really a lead on any of these hot topics of the day. They will be very encouraged and very supported to offer feedback. And sometimes they might co-draft or co-support relationships, as we have been discussing, um, close you know, diplomatic practice with Norway on questions of Palestine mm. um, within the UN Security Council. But it is not the fact that China owns the pen and will draft the resolutions day in, day out, any time this topic hits the agenda. That is quite unique. And I think the other thing to note, too, is that China traditionally has been quite cautious regarding its use of the veto. Um, and I think that is something that does set China apart. Again, I'm not saying the Americans aren't cautious, but I think the Americans really are sort of at this point 90, at least 90 vetoes deep. Um, China, since the People's Republic of China assumed the China seat in 1971, um, has been quite cautious to only cast two vetoes per decade. Then we have the Syria issue where China has now cast 10 vetoes. But really in that way, this like caution about sort of hanging up the UN Security Council, blocking it from functioning, I think is again something that China indicates its own um, interest in making sure that these institutions can function and therefore they can try and keep the UN as a focal point too. All right. Uh, we've already um, uh, talked a little bit about putting ideas and, and it initiatives forward within multilateral body, bodies and a relatively recent but I would say argue a quite high profile activity in the last few years is China putting forward a number of so-called global um, initiatives, governance initiatives. Uh, there's one on development, one on security, one on civilization, one on artificial intelligence governance, and lastly, one on data security uh, governance. And these are obviously speaking to very timely governance issues, and uh, hence also very relatable, I would say, to the UN. Is there any obvious reason China is launching these initiatives at this time? Is there, do you see like a clear incentive or something that China obviously wants to achieve? So I think it's really interesting because we've had now just over a decade of the Belt and Road Initiative and, you know, Chinese officials cite that BRI was the first global public good. Um, so trying to explain these initiatives as global public goods is something that China wants to be very clear. Um, I think some of these global initiatives, so for example, the global initiatives to do with development, security and civilization, are designed to map onto the UN's own three pillar structure of development, peace and security and human rights. Um, this three pillar structure as the way that the UN can help achieve and grow an in individual security. So China's own vision um, through GDI, GSI, and GCI um, go toe-to-toe -to -toe with those pillars, and they help make China's own broad idea about this shared future, this community of common destiny. Um, they're meant to be the strategic guidance that will induce this shared future to become more real. Um, the shared future has a couple of interesting elements. Um, one is this notion of there being flexible partnerships, so when two states can find issues to cooperate on, they should go ahead and do so. So bilaterally, they can happily work together on trade, then pursue that. But no need to then work on the difficult bilateral issues, for example, perhaps human rights. Um, but in this flexible partnership network, we have to remember that China views itself as a first amongst equals. So while there may be a democracy of international relations, as you know, again, Chinese elites refer to, big states like China, um, there has to be a level of deference and respect for their own governance systems. So in effect, the other aspect of shared future is to help us understand that there's many, many different ways for states to achieve their own unique path to modernity, development, security, and economic growth. The singular approach um, of a liberal nation building project of economic liberalization, of fundamental human rights, are things that Chinese elites see as odd artifacts of a Western experience. And so when you look at GDI, GSI, and GCI, they are efforts to help create more space for a unique pathway for each unique state. Um, in this way, these initiatives help create space between this notion of there being a fundamental human right, um, a fundamental set of values, um, universal values, accountability, equality, um, that need to be respected. So if you ask me in a practical sense, like 
why timing for these? Um, some of these I think we can see as timing of good opportunities. So China sort of making the case with the Global Development Initiative, for example, that the sustainable development goals for 2030 are lagging severely behind, especially post-COVID. And so China's ability to launch GDI is this push to help use people-to-people, -people, technology exchange, um, education and training opportunities to help try and get the SDGs back on track. So there is this sort of positive momentum that China wants to use. Hmm. Um, I think, though, we could also make the case that for some of these other initiatives, it might be the case that Chinese officials could feel a little bit more on the back foot. Um, and I would argue, for example, the Global Security Initiative, its timing to come out in April of 2022, um, is in part driven by the fact that Chinese officials will have picked up on the mood that all of this discussion about a limitless friendship with Russia um, after its invasion of Ukraine has not put China in a very good position. And so the ability to try and reorient um, the way that we think about global security governance and global security solutions may help with the timing of why we now have GSI. And the UN is a very important space for all of these various global initiatives um, to try and become real, because of course, as they're new, they are broad and they are vague, but I don't think that they should be dismissed. Hmm. Uh, let's continue kind of where you uh, finish off uh, answering answering that last question. We're sitting recording this in, in Oslo, obviously, in, in uh, Europe. Uh, obviously, here we pay a lot of attention to the war in Ukraine and the kind of um, dynamic around Russia-China relations. And uh, I hear a lot of people speak about a so-called joint kind of multilateral alliance between China and Russia that you can see in multilateral spaces. Uh, to what extent do you think it makes sense to to talk about, you know, the, the emergence of a so-called China-Russia multilateral alliance? Um, I think I'm more mindful of this, um, of such a term. I think in a lot of ways, I would argue that in the UN space, what we witness is a very pragmatic, very measured, um, very cost-benefit analysis-driven um, China. And while there are practical implications, um, you know, for the Chinese economy, if it violates sanctions. Um, I think China also is very focused on international perceptions. And so any sort of international shaming um, is something that China wants to avoid. A bad reputation um, is something China also wants to avoid. And so I think if we really look at, for example, we can take voting as one thing that we can all track, we can all go back and look at the public voting um, done by 193 states on Ukraine questions. Um, I think this limitless friendship is not necessarily a blind friendship. Um, and we can look at these voting patterns where in the UN General Assembly, there's now unfortunately annual resolutions um, on condemning Russia's invasion. Um, in the IAEA, in the UN Security Council, um, China really has cast in these spaces, the vast majority of votes have been abstention votes. China has been incredibly cautious. Um, and I think some accuse it of fence sitting, that you say limitless friendship on one end, you make the claim that you will have solutions for a peace plan for Ukraine. Um, but then your real move is to sort of sit in the middle and try and avoid choosing a side. But I think that's still not giving China credit for the type of position it wants to be seen as, which is really trying to avoid, um, I think, pressure on this limitless friendship and while also having to stand against, you know, margins are at about 140, 150 states each time that stand shoulder to shoulder with Ukraine and the UNGA, for example. Um, but then I think it gets really interesting because if we start to think about other efforts that have been used to try and discuss Ukraine, um, for example, efforts in the UN General Assembly to start a war register that will keep the costs of Russia's violence and therefore be able to present Russia with a bill at the conclusion of the war for them to rebuild Ukrainian infrastructure. Um, if we look at questions of attempts to call for Russian accountability and potentially other types of legal mechanisms like the International Criminal Court, um, China has actually taken quite a firm view and voted against these particular resolutions. Now, the UNGA resolutions also don't have teeth um, in the sense that they can call for things, whether they can actually generate physical outcomes if these resolutions had passed is a separate question. But I think, again, this is not to do with this limitless friendship. I would argue those votes are much more shaped by China's own caution about setting um, precedent for an international community that chases sovereign states. Mm. 
and hold sovereign states accountable. And I think that's something that China is not interested in seeing, as it wants to have a much more by states, for states understanding of what the UN should be doing. More focused on state sovereignty, less focused on individual security. All right. Um, we are, uh, I mean, in the midst of a uh uh, obviously, a, a world uh, politics situation with lots of uh, conflicts, uh, even worse. Uh, we're also in the midst of an escalating, I would say, or, or intensifying competition and rivalry, particularly between China and the USA. And one of the areas, not the only area, but one of the areas where the competition and rivalries is, is amongst the most intense is, of course, in areas around technology and digital uh, technology. How do we see the technology kind of uh, uh, competitive race play out in, multi in the multilateral system today? And what should we expect, you think, in the, uh, to see in the coming years? Um, I think, you know, one answer might be, I think, to expect more competition. Um, we have a secretary general who is very seized with the belief that AI and big data will help the United Nations do its job better. Um, the ability to crunch more data, the ability to understand, you know, trends to have um, the use of AI to help process these huge amounts of data that will allow the UN to have an over the horizon awareness of the problems that are escalating or will be coming. Um, and this will somehow make the UN do its job better. Um, also, we are at a point now where obviously digital technologies are moving across a whole variety of spaces. So while we might have traditionally thought about um, working groups that think about you know, AI and autonomous weapons, we could certainly now be looking at efforts in ECOSOC to think about how the AI revolution will shape the way that we have education and educational standards. So it's no longer simply a question of sort of um, strictly data governance or economic implications or military implications. There's a large variety of social, gender, um, applications for the way that AI is understood. So it's a cross-cutting issue. Um, but I think, again, you know, this is why it provides these opportunities to compete. And China also has these two other global initiatives on data security in 2020. Um, AI capacity building also offered, I believe, if I remember correctly, in 2021. Um, again, these are very kind of broad and vague. Um, China wants to promote an individual state's um, data security, the ability to maintain control, data sovereignty. Um, it's not quite clear where this, you know, global initiative has moved. Um, again, they have the AI, um, AI governance global initiative. And I think this is a relatively new one. But I think this is the one that I will end on a somewhat more optimistic note. Um, China's first push to have an AI capacity building resolution in the UN General Assembly. So an actually relatively rare occurrence that China wants to drive the resolution, and in particular in the UN General Assembly space. We can look at this as a moment of great US-China cooperation, because this resolution passed without vote, which means that a lot of deft diplomacy occurred to get to a draft that everyone could agree upon. And the same thing the U.S. pushed through its AI and human rights related resolution um, in June of this year. And again, a resolution that passed without vote and a sign potentially of great U.S.-China um, diplomacy and the ability to find cooperation even on something so difficult as sort of digital technologies and AI governance. All right. And of course, uh, how major powers uh, continue to compete and position themselves on Digitech issues within the UN and other international organizations is, of course, one of the areas we're going to work uh, a lot more closely on, also together in one of the projects that we run here at um, uh, the Institute. Now, before wrapping up, I mean, Courtney, you have been watching and following as a scholar the UN system evolve and China's involvement within it uh, for many uh, years. Uh, we are getting older. Um, is there, before wrapping up, is there anything you would like to point to concerning China and the UN that you think we as scholars, um, ourselves or our colleagues, have not been paying enough attention to? You know, something that's potentially important that we should, you know, talk more about and do more research on? I think the one topic I'm very interested in trying to learn more about um, is really the way that China thinks about staffing um, the international civil service. So the UN workers that will travel with their blue passports, 
um, where they should be acting with impartiality and only for the effort to advance the UN Charter and UN projects. Um, so setting aside national interests and really advancing their careers, not as civil servants, but as international civil servants. Um, I'm very interested in this topic for a number of reasons. I think, first off, there have been some great news articles. I'm really interested in sort of China's willingness to compete for these international leadership posts, these heads of UN agencies, um, the International Telecommunication Union, the Food and Agricultural Organization, etc. Um, and these articles, these news pieces have captured um, one version of events that are moving. And I think there is something more to dig into that to understand why China competes and how it thinks about these international civil service leadership positions. Um, I think it's also a very important topic because we have to better understand how these UN systems work. And it's not just sort of viewing these civil servants as these inert handmaidens um, that simply do a task, wrote routine. Um, there is a lot of room for dynamism and flexibility and sort of crafting and shaping the way forward for each of these international agencies. And so I think better understanding the staffing play, why China wants to engage in this space is very important, especially um, for those of us that have spent time looking at this, um, where China's overall staffing fo footprint is actually quite small and has a lot of potential to grow. Um, and Chinese officials have made great efforts. Um, more recently, China's now producing the largest number of interns into the UN system. Um, and this is viewed from the outside as a real first step for China to try and increase its staffing profile. So I think, again, while we spend a lot of time thinking about the functional issues, for example, digital and cyber, as we will be working on Hans, um, I think also understanding the background flow the workers that do the work, I think that's going to be something that will become very important. All right. So let's try to do that. It might also, of course, teach us something more about the functions and values within the UN and international organizations that our own countries have not paid so much attention to, but that Absolutely. might China actually might be seeing together with other powers. I think we'll uh, we'll end here. We'll continue our discussion in other uh, places and uh, forums. Thank you so much, Courtney, for spending the time and to our listeners for uh, tuning in. You have been listening to an episode of The World Stage, a podcast from the Norwegian Institute of International Affairs, NUPI. Thank you so much, Hans, for having me join you at NUPI and for the podcast today. Welcome back. <laughs> <laughs>